So I will talk about how the Damodar Leela is concealed and revealed in the Bhagavad Gita. So normally the Bhagavad Gita is thought of as a philosophical book and Damodar Leela is seen as Leela. But Tattva and Leela, philosophical truth and loving pastimes have an intimate connection and that is what we will try to discuss today. So let's begin with some prayers. Om Jnana Tirandasya Jnana Janishalakaya Chakshurum Litham Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Tadaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhukane Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinari Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaurani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pascha Yadesha Tahiri Pancha Kalpata Rudascha Kripa Sindhu Devacha Patita Nam Pavadibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaho Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Asvaita Dhanadhara Shiva Sadika Prabhatta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna So when we discuss the pastimes of the Lord specifically the Dhamma Leela and general the pastimes of the Lord there are certain fundamental dynamics that happen. As I said, there's Tattva and there's Leela. Tattva is philosophical analysis. And Leela is pastimes. Now, the word pastime is actually uh, English translation by Shri Prabhupada of the word Leela. Now, the, le the word Leela actually eludes any precise English translation. Because sometimes the word pastime has a connotation of frivolity. Say for example, it is said that baseball is America's national pastime. What it means is that's how people pass their time. So pass their time means what? They don't have anything to do with their time, so they pass their time somehow. That is not what is happening with Krishna. No, Krishna is the supreme controller. He can do whatever he wants. This is what he chooses to do because hate is the highest expression of love. It is the highest source of joy for him. So generally, for a Leela to happen, there have to be at least two people. Because love is reciprocal. Love is not something which is experienced in isolation. It's primarily experienced in reciprocation. So just as there are two key characters in the Damodar Leela. Who are those characters? Yashoda and Krishna. So similarly, there are two characters in the Bhagavad Gita. Who are they? Arjuna and Krishna. So we'll see how the dynamic flows between the two of them. So at the st start of the Damodar Leela, in the relationship between Yashoda and Krishna, Yashoda is in a superior position. She is after all the mother and Krishna is just a small child. And Krishna comes to her in, in need. I am hungry, I need milk. His mother is churning butter and he comes and catches hold of the water. Granny motor is, looks at her. Now, Mothers have this extraordinary capacity to sense what their children are saying. You know, for the rest of the world, the children are just gibbering. The jibber jabber, something they are doing. The mother understood what the child is saying. So, Krishna doesn't speak anything, he just looks at his mother and his mother understands. He is hungry. So basically here, Krishna is in a subordinate position. And Mother Yashoda is in a, uh, the opposite of subordinate is not such a common word, superordinate, superior, 
or superordinate position. So similarly, at the start of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is in a superior position. How is Arjuna in a superior position? Yeah, Krishna is a chariot driver, a charioteer. So, because he's a charioteer, Arjuna is giving orders to Krishna. So, so in both these pastimes, it, the pastime starts with the I normally don't consider the Bhagavad Gita as a pastime, although it is also a pastime. Hmm. But it begins with the devotee in a superordinate position. And Arjuna tells Krishna, Sena yo rupayo matte ratham sthapayme achyuta. Please get my chariot in between the two armies. I want to see. Yauditan nirikshiham yodukama navastitan. I want to see who is it that are there on the opposite side of fighting. <laughs> this request by Arjuna is like a is a bit unusual. Now, in polite circles, uh, generally people don't give instructions. They make requests, and the other person sees the request as an instruction. Can you do this? If a superior person is telling us to do, can you do this? Then we understand that means you know, I should do this. <coughs> so, now the, the way people function in cultured, civilized societies is different from how people function in, say, <coughs> middle uncultured societies. If somebody comes later, then say we have we have say we invited someone for Prasad to our place, and they come late. Now we could just get angry and yell at them. No. Why did you come late like this? <laughs> but in a cultured society, what will happen is they'll say the prasad has got cold. Now what this means is the the wise person will understand. <laughs> but some people are not sharp enough to understand. You can eat it, can't you? <laughs> so you missed the point. <laughs> so one devotee came to me once after a class and he said, I have a serious philosophical question. Okay, he says, if I insult someone and that person does not get the insult, then do I get the karma? <laughs> <laughs> so I told him that, first of all, if you are concerned about karma, then better not insult him. <laughs> I am so concerned. But basically, actually, the rightness of our and wrongness of our actions are determined by three factors. The content of the action, the intent of the action and the consequence of the action. What we do, why we do and what happens after doing it. So in this case, the, the consequence may not have been offered. That person may not have felt insulted. But you had the intent and that's why some culpability will be there even then. So the point is that here Arjuna is giving an instruction to Krishna. They are cooperating, of course, and Krishna has voluntarily taken the subordinate position. But if Krishna has taken that subordinate position, he is expected to follow the instruction. So Krishna follows the instruction, but Krishna doesn't suffer any fools. Now Krishna, when following instructions, also does his own thing. And what does he do? He brings the chariot in the middle of the battlefield, but not just anywhere in the middle of the battlefield. See, this is say one side of the army, this is the other side of the army. Now, both these armies are spread out over a large distance. So, the, what does the middle of the two armies mean? The middle of the two armies, if you say, is like one line. But on that one line, Krishna could have placed the chariot anywhere, isn't it? So, for example, in the middle of this room, if you say between Shri Prabhupada and Alder, it's here. But the middle could be the left and left side, left extreme, right extreme, somewhere anywhere in between the middle. So what Krishna does is, Krishna brings the army in the middle, but where middle where Arjuna can clearly see Bhishma Dron Pramukta Sarvesham Chamahikshitam Uvacha Partha Pashaitan Samavetan Kuruniti. So Krishna brings the chariot right in the middle. 
at that point the Bhishma and Drona are most prominently visible. So that means right in front of Bhishma and Drona. So why is that? Because Krishna has his own plan. Krishna wants to speak the Bhagavad Gita while the Arjuna will be enlightened. And for Arjuna's eventual enlightenment, his initial confusion is necessary. So he has a little indecision. But from that little indecision, things are escalated to total confusion. And that is Krishna's, Krishna's, we could say, mischievousness. Now Krishna in Kurukshetra that seem like a child who is committing mischief. But Krishna has his own sense of time, place and circumstance. And he has his own plan. So this is how things happen. Krishna is in a subordinate position, but still Krishna within the parameters imposed by the subordinate position is still pursuing his plan. So similarly, in the Damodha Lila, Krishna is in a subordinate position. Mm -hmm. But what happens is when when he sees, when he steals butter, and after stealing butter, he decides to commit some more mischief. We know the whole story. At first, Mother Yashoda says that. Okay, I'll give you some milk, but then she sees some, uh, she sees some milk getting heated up, so she puts Krishna aside. And Krishna is enraged. So how dare you take away my milk? It's like from Krishna's perspective, let's say after, uh, after, uh, after say we are hungry, we have a long program, and we are hungry, and there's a big feast, and we are relishing the feast, and it's some delicious savouries there, maybe some very well made kheer is there. So we take a spoon and we eat one spoon. And just to taste it, relish it, we close our eyes and relish it. And after we finish relishing it, we take for another spoon, the whole plate has disappeared. <laughs> hey, what happened? Where did it go? <laughs> so, from Krishna's perspective, it is like that. He's incensed. So I was drinking milk, I was relishing it. How did the mother just drop me and go away like this? Oh, in his anger, he decides. That I'm going to do some mischief. So he runs around, he finds some more butter, he eats it, then he thinks he wants to break some butter. He says his mood is, you know, for this butter, my mother left me, so I will teach this butter a lesson. So he breaks the butter, and he lets it spill all over. And then, you know what happens is, while Krishna is completely transcendental, but Krishna acts like a human being. Nara Leela Kaivalyam, the Vedanta Sutra says. So, so when we approach Krishna Leela, we could have two extremes. One is, we, if we consider a pendulum, one extreme would be to think that Krishna is just like an ordinary child. And therefore, we reduce the entire relationship to just a mundane, mischievous child who needs to be disciplined. The other extreme, is to think that Krishna is so completely transcendental that there is nothing we can analyze, nothing can relate. We can only worship this past time. And there's nothing we can learn from it at all. So in between is the understanding that, that there are principles of loving and serving that are universal. That are applicable both in material relationships and in spiritual relationships. That ultimately, if you care for someone, if we love someone, then how we express that love? How we sustain that relationship? Those principles are similar in material and spiritual relationships. Actually, even the word material and spiritual are not that appropriate. Because what do we mean by a material relationship? The word material is such a big word. Within material, there is Sattva Guna, there is Rajo Guna, and there is Tamu Guna. And all three are not the same. Okay, in, when we go to America, I just in America before I came here, a month before. So they say, are you from Asia? Now there is practically no Indian who thinks I am in Asia. No, we are Indian, not just Indian, we are South Indian, North Indian. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because of South Indian, Telugu, not Kannad. <laughs> 
<laughs> so there's so many different. So Asian is uh, nothing to criticize Asia, but Asia is such a big continent. You know, in Asia you can have Chinese, you can have Japanese, you can have Filipino, you can have Middle East, you can have Indians, you can have so many different demographics and so many different cultures. So it's such a huge description as to be practically very unhelpful. Even from an ethnic perspective, if you consider the ethnography, the racial characteristics, it's very different. Though, so, so similarly, when you use the word material, it's a huge spectrum from a relationship in the mode of ignorance to a relationship in the mode of goodness. All of you call it material. In California, they have made a rule that you know, in, 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 in there's a small child, the child, there's a baby seat for the child at the back. And they found that many times parents, they are so, it's, it's actually an insult to use the word parents for them. But anyway, parents are so lost in their head that they drive to a particular place and they forget that there's a baby behind them. They just go away. So now, the new car that they are making, that if the baby is alone behind, then the car, if somebody tries to lock it, hmm, lock it, then the car will start beeping very loudly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> to alert and don't leave your baby there. <laughs> so, the point is, okay, this, parents who have that level of forgetfulness, they forget that even the child exists. You know, that is completely Thomas in parents. And on the other hand, we have parents who are who are constantly worried, constantly concerned, you know, that is my parent, child healthy, is my child safe, is, am I imparting the right values to the child, children. Across the world and I travel, one of the biggest concerns of devotees is how can we help our children to grow up, to become good human beings, to good devotees. So even if so there is a wide spectrum. Now, even if somebody isn't, is not spiritually inclined, but they are concerned that the children become good human beings. So there is a big spectrum. So the point is that material involves Satona, Rajona, Tamona, goodness, passion, and ignorance. And these three are very different. So the point, so going back to the Amodhali, the point I was making is that the principles of loving and serving, the principles that underlie sustainable and satisfying relationships, they are common. Whether they have been Krishna-centered relationships, I'm using the word Krishna-centered as a spiritual, or a relationship where Krishna may not be the center. Those principles are similar. So here what happens is, in Dhamma Leela, Krishna is, in one sense, acting like a mischievous child. He's simply acting out. And so there is a real rage. And because of the rage, he just throws a tantrum, throws things around, breaks some things. But then, so then the nature of rage is that it is something which surges up and then it surges down. And then after that we wonder, what did I do? Why did I do that? Yeah. Just like there are alcoholics, there are shopaholics. There are, you know, people give shop, 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 shop till you drop. <laughs> so, it's like that. so afterwards somebody asks, why did you buy this? Yeah, no, why did I buy it? I don't know. <laughs> it's like that. So for Krishna, his rage is there and his rage subsides. And then he realizes, I big trouble. <laughs> what did I do? My mother will be angry with me. So there's a part of him which is still some residual anger is there and a part where there is fear. So from there, he runs away, he runs to another place and he's trying to feed butter of the monkey, monkeys who come around. But then he sees Mother Yashoda or he senses that she is there. And he senses that she is there, he just jumps down and starts running. Now, in one sense, Mother Yashoda is sort of in control because Krishna is running away from her and Mother Yashoda is trying to catch him. And he keeps running, keeps running, he runs here, runs there, runs there. And finally, although he is much younger and Mother Ishwada is much uh, older, but Mother Ishwada is also taller, her legs are longer. Eventually, Krishna lets himself be God. And we could say in one sense, 
Krishna is complying with his devotee's will. But Krishna is doing his own thing on his own. In that entire courtyard, Krishna could have been caught anywhere. But Krishna gets caught very close to these two giant. Now, that is Arjuna Amla Arjuna trees. And so, they have a huge courtyard. If you go to Vrindavan, uh, even now, there is Nandaka and Gokul Mahavan and the rest of the places of Vrindavan. So, in the big courtyard, Krishna would have been caught anywhere, but Krishna gets caught at a place where these two trees are not very far away and at a place where a grinding motor is also nearby. So by this, what Krishna is doing is Krishna is advancing his own plan. So Mother Yashoda, she is, as Krishna is running away from her, now she's getting exhausted, she's getting exasperated, she's also getting infuriated, she's getting enraged. And she decides, I want to punish Krishna. But now, when there is punishment, why does Mother Yashoda want to punish Krishna? So it is, at one level, she feels that you know, how can my child be undisciplined like this? See, when we love someone, we don't want to hear anything bad about that person. Even if we hear something bad about that person, we don't want to believe it. We reject it. So similarly, what has happened is that many of the other gopis have come to Mother Yashoda. And they have complained. Krishna steals butter in our house, houses. And Mother Yashoda never really believed it. And Krishna is also a great actor. <laughs> you know, Krishna, whenever he complains, he has a complaint, Krishna presents such a sweet, innocent face. You know, this chip, I don't even know what stealing is. <laughs> <laughs> like that. So, because of that, Mother Yashoda doesn't give much credits to those charges. But still, at the back of the mind, that is the nature of criticism or accusation. So when something is heard, it is almost impossible to make it unheard. Uh, when something is goes inside our head, there is no delete button or erase button. So it stays there. And now when Mother Yashoda sees for herself that Krishna has done so much mischief, that is how it is all that I have heard about him in the past. Must be true. Must be true. And as she thinks like this, okay. So, okay. It is charged? So, as she, am I audible? Yes. Okay. So, as she is thinking like this, at one level, it may seem that. She's simply upset. My child, how can he do like this? How can my child be undisciplined like this? But Kavi Karnapur in his Anandavan Jampu describes that her concern is much more selfless. She's thinking that if Krishna keeps stealing like this, then Krishna will develop a, get a reputation that he's a thief. And if he gets a reputation that he's a thief, when he grows up, who will give their daughter in marriage to him? <laughs> so she's worried about his future and therefore she says I have to discipline I have to put a stop to this so then initially she after she catches Krishna she has a stick but when she sees this she, Krishna sees the stick Krishna acts so scared he just Trembling, he cannot even look in his mother in the face. Sometimes when we are very scared of someone, yeah. or some people, they just look so, uh, they just look so scary. Uh, I go to one particular place while I'm traveling. There, one person, he comes and sits right in front. And throughout the class, he just glares at me. <laughs> Not even stares, just glares. <laughs> And even if there is some humor in the class, this is a laugh keeps glaring. So the only way I can give a class is look at everyone except that person. <laughs> <laughs> so 
generally if if somebody is very scary we we don't even want to look at that person so like that krishna is vaktram niniya bhay bhavanaya se vaktram niniya is that is tilted down he look it down he try to avoid even looking at padreshwara and at that time ishwara starts thinking that now i want to punish krishna but i won't want to terrorize him so much that he goes away from me right now he ran away from me but i could catch him but in future if he runs away who knows where he will run away and then you will catch him so i have to scare him but not scare him away there's always a thin line you know we want to discipline so they don't do the wrong thing but he disciplines so much and then the person just because of the discipline does the wrong thing <laughs> <laughs> so therefore she puts the stick aside and then she decides to tie him up so at this point while she is thinking she is doing her own thing it is krishna who is doing his own thing arjuna is thinking he is doing his own thing she says i want to go in the middle of the two armies and see what is uh, see so so we are going to see i want to discipline krishna but krishna is planning his own thing through it all so when she decides i want to discipline krishna by tying him up okay where do i tie him up there is a grinding mortar right nearby okay i'll tie krishna with this so the, so through whatever plans we are making krishna is making his own plans that sometimes our plans may be independent of krishna's plans may be compliant with krishna's plans may be with his blessings may be without his blessings but no matter what we do krishna's plan is still operational always so then as krishna and arjuna start speaking in the gita so we are discussing parallels between the bhagavad gita and the damodar lila so as krishna starts speaking eventually they have a very meaningful and deep discussion but at one particular point while krishna has teacher arjuna accepts that krishna is extremely wise arjuna accepts that krishna is god but at the same time there is this intense philosophical discussion going on and then the 11th chapter arjuna asks the ஒரு <laughs> 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 yanchanya drishtam ichhase he says what you are asked to see i'll show you and i'll show you something more also so okay we have our plan but the krishna we seem to be going along with our plan but krishna also has his plan that is also going along with it then what is this extra that krishna shows arjuna So, but initially, when Arjuna says, "Please show me," you know, Sir Pankaj Krishna says, "Yes, I'll show it to you." The Vyam the Dham Amite Jagshin, Pashyame Yoga Ma Ishwaram. I will show you the divine form, and I'll give you the eyes by which you can see this divine form. So, in one sense, we don't have the picture of the Vishnu bowl here. So, normally, how we see it is, if you have seen those pictures, this Arjuna here, this Krishna here. and krishna is pointing hand like this and then we see the universal form here so it's just a pictorial depiction in two dimensions which has limitations actually what happens when krishna shows the universal form to arjuna at that time krishna disappears because it is krishna showing his universal form so it is not that krishna krishna says i will i will be my universal form to you and arjuna no longer sees krishna I know so only that sees only the universe and that's why he says tanantam madhyam na punastavadi pashyami vishveshwara vishwarupa he says i can't see the beginning i can't see the middle i can't see the end i see the is the vast pushyam deep tanantam 
this bright from the earth to the sky, this is spreading in all directions. I see this and identify this. And well, this is the Vishwarupa, it's a universal form. So, Krishna expands and covers all of space. So, there is, in general, in, in the past days of Krishna, there is this sweetness and there is this greatness. His sweetness, what is it called in Sanskrit? Ma, yeah, Madhurya. Yeah. And his greatness is his? Aishwarya. Yes, thank you. So, his Aishwarya and his Madhurya. Both are there. And both of them exist in a dynamic succession and tension. Succession means one comes after another, after another. And then tension, which is going to be manifested when there's a tension between the two. So in both these pastimes, we begin with the Madhurya. The Madhurya means out of love, Krishna subordinates himself to his devotee. So out of love, Krishna is like a small child who is dependent on his mother in Adamudilla. Out of love, Krishna has become the charioteer of Arjuna. So there is the Madhurya that is manifest. And then from the Madhurya, there is, there is, a, there is a sweet reciprocation with the Madhurya going on. And then from there, the Aishwari manifests. So this is what happens both in the Ramudha Lila and in the Bhagavad Gita Swaroop. So initially, when Arjuna sees the universal form, he says, with mythos, he says, this is awesome. And awesome is like a typical teenager adjective for everything. <laughs> the food is awesome, the picnic was awesome, the, the, the music was awesome, the new school is awesome, everything is awesome. It's only your vocabulary that is not awesome. <laughs> <laughs> when the duty circle and some words get overused, like wonderful. Everything, the class is wonderful, the masala was wonderful, the kirtan is wonderful. It's wonderful that you don't know any other words other than wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, but with aw, there are two words. There is awesome and there is awful. <laughs> 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 now, once again, so there are similar words, which, which actually, similar sounding words, which have very different meanings. Once I gave a class, and after the devotee came, the bright smile says, Bro, this class was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what? I was looking at you, see, the bright smile. And then I understood that he actually wanted to say terrific. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, I initially said this, this universal form is awesome. But from awesome, he says, suddenly, he says, I am becoming alarmed, I am becoming aghast. So, within that awesome universal form, he starts seeing something which is awful. Now, generally we don't want to use the word, because nowadays the word awful has a negative connotation in sense of dreadful. Hmm? The awful means horrible, dreadful, gruesome, that's what we mean by awful. But, awful previously, maybe a hundred years before, the meanings of words change over time. Hmm? So, so, awful previously meant something that filled us with awe. So, how when we see so, our full, something that makes us full of awe. When we see something, awe is a feeling of reverence, of uh, humility in the, in the sight of, or the presence of something stupendous. So, if somebody goes to the Himalayas, and sits at the foot of the Himalayas, and looks up and sees this huge mountain, roaring up as far as the eyes can see. That's a, that's a awful sight. It's an awesome sight. So, in the, so awf, awesome is just wonderful. Awful means something which makes us feel small, something which is like scarily wonderful. It's it's wonderful, but it's scarily wonderful. So so it's filled with you know sense of fear. Now why is Arjuna filled with fear over here? Because Krishna slowly starts manifesting his special form. 
So Arjuna is seeing this universal form and he's it's spread all over, up and down, left and right, everywhere. And as he sees this, that actually it's so effulgent that I really can't see things properly. It's the Riksham Samantha, it's difficult to see. But as he starts seeing and he starts discerning, and he says, he says that Tamishtra Karana Nichate Bhayana Kani. He says there are these dreadful teeth that are coming out of the mouth. And then Kalana Lasan Nibhani, that there is a fire of destruction coming out of the mouth. It seems like some kind of uh, uh, scary monster kind of thing. There are these horror movies. Now, horror movies, Janda, that I never understood. Even in pretty devotional life, I was never a big fan of movies. I like to read books more. But you know, I said, why would somebody want to get horrified? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you want to be entertained. Yes, there are different ways of being entertained. But why would somebody want to be horrified? Actually, the point is that life is so boring that any stimulation is better than no stimulation. <laughs> <laughs> so even horror is a stimulation. And in the spiritual level, there is a vipatsa, the bayanaka. There is that. There is one of the rasas, which is their relationship with Krishna. So there is something original also. But here, Arjuna gets, it seems like a sudden horror. It's a horror movie. There are different genres of movies. Like suppose somebody goes to watch some, there's a family friendly romantic comedy movie and then suddenly it turns out to be like a ghastly monster movie with all kind of horrors. I say, what happened? This is not what I signed up for. <laughs> so Arjuna says, I wanted to see a universal form, but what am I seeing over here? So he, what does he see? He sees that this fire is coming from the mouth and that is ghastly looking teeth which are protruding from the mouth. And all the warriors of the battlefield are drawn in. And as they're drawn in, they're getting burned. Those who are surviving the fire, as they're entering into the mouth, they're just hitting the, hitting the teeth. And then churri the yuttamangri. They're just getting smashed. Their skulls are getting smashed. And then as blood is spilling over, sometimes the murder can also kill. Violence and action can be shown in different ways also. Then children movies or something like that, they show violence, but they may not show blood or death or something like that. Sometimes the horror movie, there's a this person sitting and a bullet hits and suddenly it's of a skull, it's just an explosion of red blood. So it's like that, it's, it's ghastly. So he's, the Arjuna is a person who is a warrior, trained to fight throughout his life. But still the sight that he sees is so ghastly that he gets unnerved. And he said, what is this? And he asked eventually, Amkya Vimeko Bhavanu Grarupo. I asked him, Who are you? Who are you? Now, this is a peculiar question at one level. Because Arjuna has already told, identified, this is the, you are the Vishwarupa. But still, he is asking, Who are you? Now, he, he has the significant word. He is not saying to Krishna, What is that? It's not, it's like a friend says, Let's go and watch a movie. And we are watching a movie together. And then it turns out to be a horror movie. He says, What is this? And look, and her friend has disappeared. <laughs> and I want to watch this. <laughs> so for Arjuna, he's like that. He says, We ask, you show, we ask that from who are you? So why is he asking who are you? Because what has happened is he he knows about the Vishwarupa. The Vishwarupa is the form that spreads across space from the whole universe that is compassed by the Vishwarupa. But this destructive aspect, you know, living beings entering into the mouth, getting destroyed, fire coming on the mouth, this has not been shown by Krishna previously when he showed the universal form. Earlier, when has Krishna showed the universal form? Duryodhana. Duryodhana. So at that time, it was fearsome. But this particular part was not there. And also, whom else was he shown it to? Ishwara. And then also, it was, it is very stunning but sweet. Ishwara saw what? She saw the whole universe and she saw herself also. And she saw herself looking at the mouth of Krishna. So, that was bewildering, but it was not a horrifying form. It's horrifying. So that's why Arjuna said, what's going on? It's like, as I said earlier, that we are 
we we are we go to watch uh, we go to watch some rom com and suddenly it turns out to be horror movie. Then we ask, what is going on? What is this? Yeah. So Arjuna asks, him, suppose we are doing our exam. Then he is going. We met an old friend after many years, and he is going for a walk. We are going for a walk, and suddenly we are dozen thugs attack us. And as we are concerned, what to do? Our friend suddenly accepts some exhibits certain martial art moves. And in two minutes, all those dozen thugs were on the ground, <laughs> helpless. And then I turn at our friend, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> so when we ask our friend, who are you? What does that mean? I know who you are, but I don't know who you are. <laughs> when we see something unfamiliar in someone familiar, we ask, who are you? It's, we know somebody to be a very serious person. And one day that person comes and just starts joking and is very different from the normal. We, we may ask, hey, who are you? What have you done to my serious friend? <laughs> <laughs> so like that, Arjuna is asking, I know about the Vishwarupa, but what is this? So who are you? And then, that's why Arjuna, what is Krishna's answer? Krishna doesn't say, I am Krishna. I am Krishna, your old friend, don't you recognize me? I am the Vishwarupa and you already identified it. What does Krishna say? Kalo Sviloka Kshaykrit Pravritto is I am Tam. So the Kala Rupa, the universe has two main dimensions. I said talk about space <coughs> and time. <coughs> so God's So God's pervasion across space was already shown by Krishna to Krishna to Duryodhana, Krishna to Yashoda. But God's pervasion across time. That means how God Krishna's plan was going to manifest in the future. That was shown by Krishna only to Arjuna. Arjuna, you're thinking that all these warriors will be saved in the future? But they will not be saved. They will not be saved. It is not you who are killing them. It is their own karma that is going to kill them. And you are simply an instrument in that. So basically what Krishna from his Madhurya moves towards a stunning revelation of his Aishwari. And then Arjuna is bewildered. Who are you? The same thing Krishna does with Yashoda also. Now Krishna does not expand his form. One of the aspects of Krishna Lila in, in Vrindavan is that Krishna exhibits his greatness without any of the uh, conventional uh, trappings of greatness. Trappings means uh, symbols of greatness. For example, Krishna defeats and neutralizes, completely overpowers fearsome demons who have terrorized even the devtas. But Krishna does that effortlessly without even using a single weapon. In the entire Krishna and Vrindavan, Krishna never used a weapon. Why is that? Because Krishna doesn't want to disturb the new of Vrindavan. So, Bala Kreed and Akam Iba. It's a child playing with toys. Sometimes the child becomes angry with the toy, just throws the toy down and breaks. So, like that, Krishna seems to destroy the demons. So, Krishna in Vrindavan, does not exhibit a ghastly kind of form. But Krishna is the same sweet, helpless looking, endearing little boy. But Madhuri is is not trying to tie him. It is trying to tie him. And what happens? It just goes on. He says, no amount of rope is enough. No, however which he ties, the rope is just not enough. The rope is just not enough. The rope is just not enough. So, as this is going on, she's perplexed. She's she's of course she's annoyed, she's irritated, she's perplexed. And he says, what brain, what's happening? Why is the rope not enough? What is going on? And slowly, as she's going on like this, she starts realizing this child is someone special. This child, what is this? Who is this child? So she is, her mood changes 
from chastisement to amazement. Mm -hmm. And from amazement it moves from, from exasperation to appreciation. And then as she started doing that, slowly Krishna lets himself be tired. So although there is no dialogue between Krishna and uh, and uh, uh, sorry, Krishna and Yashoda on the uh, in this whole Leela. It's interesting now according to different commentators that are they take different perspectives and give different insights. So it said according to one commentator that in the entire Damodar Leela, Krishna does not speak a single word. Right from the beginning. If you see, Krishna just tells Mother that he holds on to her sari and her uh, uh, churning later than and just identify that he wants he wants milk. And then runs away and he's feeding. Feeding to the monkey. And then he's running away and then he's looking fearful, fearful, fearful glances looking at her. Now, of course, when the Naluku and Maniguru offer prayers, at that time Krishna responds briefly. But then that is a significantly different flavor. There is not a Vrindavan flavor. So in the past, uh, when the movie industry just started, there was something called silent movies. Now if you watch silent movies, you don't have to watch any movies, but if you watch silent movies, it's, it can seem very boring. But what happened is that at that time, when there was no dialogue, actually pe the people had to focus much more on acting skills. And then kind of convey emotions and expressions without any verbal support. So the Damodar Leela, which is from Krishna's perspective, Krishna is, like a, is a silent actor in the movie. But Krishna is, is not doing anything and yet he is doing everything. So there is no speaking between Krishna and Yeshwada much. But without speaking, Krishna is just acting like a tender child, helpless child. Through it all he is speaking. He's conveying a lot. As Krishna starts manifesting his Aishwarya, that is, the, from the Madhuri, the Aishwarya is going on. But in, in, the, in the Lord's pastimes, Krishna does not manifest his greatness simply for the purpose of manifesting his greatness. Actually, his Aishwarya is manifested also for the purpose of enhancing the Madhuri. Even the manifestation of greatness is for the purpose of reciprocating love. And that is true in the Bhagavad Gita and that is true in the Damodar Leela also. So how that is true, we'll discuss in tomorrow evening session. So this parallel between the Bhagavad Gita and Damodar Leela is what we'll continue tomorrow also. I'll summarize what I discussed and if there are good questions we can conclude with that. So I talked about the three main points. First is, while Tattva and Leela can seem very dissimilar, the Gita is Tattva and now Leela is Leela, we both have a common denominator and that is love. Krishna speaks the wisdom out of love and Krishna performs Leela out of love. And then the first similarity is that in both, Krishna begins with he being in the subordinate position to his devotee. He is the small child in Damodilla and he is the, the charioteer in Krishna Lila. And while Krishna is playing the appropriate role as a subordinate, obeying Arjuna's instructions or running away from in fear from other Ishwada as a mischievous child, while Krishna in his subordinate position also is still furthering his own plan. Krishna gets the chariot in between the two armies. But in front of Bhishma and Buddha. So that Arjuna will, his confusion will be complete discombobulation, complete overwhelming. And similarly, Arjuna Krishna is running around here and there, but eventually gets himself be caught close to the Yamalaj trees and close to the grinding wall. So that his further plan can be made. And then from that Madhurya, where he is subordinated, he moves towards Aishwarya. How when Krishna, Arjuna, when Krishna reveals his Aishwarya, his greatness, Arjuna asks to show the universal form, but Krishna shows something far more. That is the Kala Rupa, which is not just of awesome, but it is awful. We don't use the word awful, but Prabhupada also uses that. I talk about that. Prabhupada says that this is a, a godless display of openness. 
Now I'll explain that tomorrow. It's a God is displaying his opulence, and Prabhupada is saying this is a godless display of opulence. So how is that possible? <laughs> but the idea is that there is a scary display, and how that changes the mood of Krishna relationship. That's what we'll discuss later. But the, from the Madhurya, the Ishwari is manifested, and this is all for furthering the reciprocation of the relationship. Similarly. Because Vrindavan has a particular mood, so the Aishwari is not manifested in that uh, a scary or ghastly way. But Krish Krishna is the same form, same little divinity form. But within that, he somehow mystically expands so that no amount of rope is enough to tie him. And this is Arjuna's emotion changes on beholding Krishna's Kala Rupa. Yashoda's emotion also changes on encountering Krishna's Aishwari from the mood of chastisement to the mood of amazement, from exasperation to appreciation. And how the relationship moves further, although Krishna is like a silent, almost like a silent actor, according to some commentators in the Kamala, still he is doing the Lord. So how it moves forward, we'll discuss in tomorrow's session. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Wonderful class. Um, is it true that uh, Krishna displayed his universal form in 64 dimensions and that's why Arjuna needed special eyes? Okay. Did Krishna display his universal form in 64 dimensions that's why he needed special eyes? I never read anything about 64 dimensions specifically. And that Krishna displayed in 64 dimensions is also open to question. So the reason is specifically why he needed special eyes is twofold. We can look at it from the from the Mahabharat's perspective and from the Bhagavatam's perspective. These two are different. Mahabharat is Arj, the Mahabharat perspective is Arjuna is a very dutiful Kshatriya warrior. Bhakti is a part of him, but Bhakti is not what is prominent in the Mahabharat. In the Bhagavatam, Bhakti is what is prominent. So from the Mahabharat's perspective, Arjuna is a Manava, Arjuna is on the earth. In the cosmic alignment, there is the earth, there is the Terrestrial middle planetary system, low planetary system, high planetary systems, and then beyond is the spiritual world. So, seeing the universal form is something that is possible for those with elevated consciousness. Not even the devta, those about the rishis and munis, the tapaloka and the loka like that. They get to see the universal form. So, from that perspective, Arjuna was blessed to see something higher, which is not accessible normally to humans. And that's why he needed those special eyes. But another perspective is that Arjuna is only performing a Leela on the earth in Krishna. So if you consider this, Arjuna is already at this level. Arjuna is a transcendental level. He has a personal relationship with Krishna. And he is already beholding the form of Krishna. So from that perspective, from there to see the universal form is actually a step down. Because he is directly seeing the Krishna form. And that's why when he says it's divyam dadami te chakshu, it's divine eyes. Divine in the sense here means celestial, considering the connected with the devatas or that level of reality. So there, this is definitely a special vision. But that special vision is lower than the special vision that is normal for Arjuna because of his great devotion. So it's specifically because from both perspectives, whether you consider a human being in the Mahabharata perspective, exemplary human being, from Mahabharata perspective, or right? Exemplary devotee from Bhagavad perspective. From both those perspectives, the level at which Arjuna was was not the appropriate level for seeing the universal form. And that's why he needed a special vision. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Krishna, thank you so Krishna. much for the class. Please excuse me for my question. Krishna's Dhamma Darvinda. I know it is a very auspicious thing he did this with So. Because every day the trees are all they already there in the yard and Yashoda Maya is all, all every day feeding in Krishna. So why did you choose that specific day? Is there a... So why did Krishna choose a specific day? <laughs> well, again, there are two ways of looking at it. I'll tell, tell both ways and then I'll tell which are Acharyas prefer. So, for example, say, why does Krishna wear a peacock feather? 
Krishna could be anything else also. He could be nothing also. Uh, why does Krishna use a flute? Krishna could play a harmonium also. <laughs> <laughs> Krishna could do anything. So one answer, the answer is that it is it is Krishna's Krishna is for art. Krishna is supremely free. And what he does is his personal preference. And that is his that is that is what is the beauty of his personality. It's very difficult for us also to quantify or not quantify but explain if we like something why do you like it yeah. so that's what devotee with who i was uh, a senior pro disciple he likes to just cross exam so we were taking prasad together so the, the devotee who was hosting me said i know me i heard you like this subject yeah i, I didn't want to get into the discussion so i was hesitating <laughs> i said yes why do you like the subject <laughs> <laughs> now we can say because it is healthy, but that's not really the reason. Why do we like something? We like something. Now, if somebody says, you know, okay, now I like this particular law of Krishna, or I like this Kirtan, or something. We can't give a reason for our likes, but we can't always give a reason for our likes. And as long as, say, if they are broadly within the parameters of Dharma, then there is no, no need to deconstruct them too much. So it's just what a person likes is just what makes them a person. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> so Krishna's choices or Krishna's preferences, they are a part of his personality. Now, uh, and they are what make him attractive. And in general, this is the this is the mm, this is the way our acharyas are preferred. That is now. Krishna is Swarat and he, so he likes to play a few, he likes to be a big off weather. That's what who he is. Why is Krishna Gopal? Why is if Krishna likes milk? Well, buffaloes give more milk than cows. Why is Krishna not Bhespa? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is not that Krishna dislikes buffaloes. Krishna likes buffaloes also. Krishna likes Sudhadam Sarva Bhutana. He likes all living beings. But Krishna is a person and it's his choice. Now, having said that, there could be another way of looking at it. And we could say that, so then, now these are, these are interpretations that could be given. And they are, as long as they are consistent with the philosophy, they can be seen as an additional meaning. So, there are devotees who, nowadays the environmental movement is quite active. So, the devotees often try to say now, Krishna is the ultimate eco-friendly deity. <laughs> So, Krishna does not use any artificial perfumes, artificial decorations. You know, he uses nature, nature decoration, nature paints. And he uses a peacock feather. He doesn't even have to pluck it from a peacock. It just falls off from a peacock. So, it is, it is actually, you can say, Ahimsa beauty product. <laughs> we have Ahimsa milk. So, like that, we have a non violent beauty product. So there's no hurting a peacock when you take a peacock feather out. Sometimes, sometimes people get fur clothes. And those uh, animals have to be killed for getting the fur clothes. But it's not like that here. <laughs> so similarly, Krishna's flute. Now it's it's made from wood. It's nature. So Vrindavan is the example of living in harmony with the beauty of, not just with nature, but with the beauty of nature. So from that perspective, you can give an expression like that. And, but this is not the explanation that our Acharyas have preferred each other. There could be particular stories where, where a uh, peacock, <coughs> there was once something like, one story in our tradition that you know, once Radharani was in the forest and at that time, a, a huge peacock suddenly came towards her. And seeing that peacock, Radharani got scared and she ran. So Radharani and Krishna had, Radharani had quarreled with Krishna and she was not ready to see Krishna in that time. And what happened was seeing that peacock coming towards the other land, right? And she's simply running away from the peacock. And she didn't realize where she was running. And she ran, ran, and ran, and she ran straight into the embrace of Krishna. <laughs> and then Krishna thanked the peacock. You got reunited. <laughs> Re reunited with my love. And therefore, as an expression of my gratitude, I will wear your feather. So there are stories like that. 
But then you can say, does that mean that Krishna was not wearing a peacock feather before this past day? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is an eternal ornament of Krishna. But it could be that when Krishna manifests on this earth, at a particular point, he starts exhibiting a body. It's not that Krishna is born with a flute in his mouth. It's a particular time he starts playing a flute. So well, this a particular time he starts wearing a peacock feather. So this kind of uh, this kind of explanations can be given. So as far as Damodar Lila being performed on a particular day is concerned, I haven't read any particular explanation. Even Damodar Ashtakam's explanation Sanan Goswami gives the is a critical commentary. That also doesn't mention any reason for that. So in general, unless our Acharya is emphasized, we don't uh, we don't go into the reason for particular personal attributes of Krishna. They are just they are uh, they are because Krishna is. That's how Krishna is. In a sense. Yeah. Hey, last question. So, yes, um, uh, how to understand that is eternity principle of Leelas when we are uh, limited of time, time like past, present, future, the eternity principle. So if everything is eternal in the spiritual world, yeah. then how do we understand Leela? <coughs> well, eternal, there are many different ways of understanding what is eternal. In the Christian tradition, for example, they have the idea that uh, when a man and a human unite, that time a soul is created. And from then on, the soul is eternal. So their definition of eternal is no end. Beginning but no end. And now, the traditional understanding of eternal is no beginning and no end. But so eternal can be defined in different ways. So Krishna says, so now specifically, with respect to the Leela or the spiritual world being eternal, the Leelas being eternal. What that means is that not that there is no flow of time, but rather the flow of time does not cause the deterioration of anything. Okay. Like in this particular pastime or in the in the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna defines himself as time. Kalos me, but immediately he follows that with Lokakshay Kutpravitto. Time Maya the destroyer of the worlds. So why the destroyer of the world? Because now time does three things. Time leads to creation, time also leads to maintenance, time also leads to destruction. Specifically on the battlefield, destruction is also going to happen. So that's why Krishna emphasized that. So in the spiritual world, time brings about transformation, but no deterioration, no destruction. That means, let's say Yeshwada Maya and Nandamaha are a little older. They are little more middle aged. So that is how they are eternally. It's not that they grow older and older and older. That's how they are. So Krishna is a youthful teenager and that's uh, is around 16 in the spiritual world. That's how he is always. So, so that means that the flow of time does not have any controlling effect in terms of causing deterioration. Everything in the spiritual world exists to enhance Krishna's pastimes. So Krishna performs different leelas at different times. And that the change in time simply facilitates the performance of various pastimes. So when the gopas, they wake up in the morning, right from the morning they are looking forward. Oh, today we will go out in the forest with Krishna. So when will we go out? When will we go out? And the gopis, they are looking forward. When will Krishna come back in the evening? And then he will be with us. So when he's going out, we will see him from the terraces. When he comes back, we'll be in the terraces and we'll see him from when he's coming back. So the passage of time simply gives devotees something to look forward to and to reciprocate the love of Krishna. So that's the meaning of eternal. Okay. So thank you very much. Krishna Bhagwan ki. Shadamodalila ki. Shrimad Bhagavad Gita ki. Shri the Prabhupada, the key, 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 the key